Chào bạn ơi. He does the same thing about you, I guess. You guys have a regular a standing appointment. Oh, I just. Well, I told him how you said I was very cheap. Nothing. Now I'm just talking about the, uh, the chamber of things. Oh. And he always stops by with his hair, so I see his hands in the world. He pays his bill the old fashioned way. Yeah, he's good for the old uh, stuff. Up. Yeah, he's good for that. That's one way for you. <laughs> well, it's kind of cute. Or what? Apparently, he's limited him. Yeah, that would be fine. Okay, uh, Council uh, Bob Bells, uh, let's uh, come uh, to order. Uh, Councilman Guard will not be here this evening. We'll begin our study session December 18th, final meeting of 2017. Merry Christmas to all. Uh, planning and zoning, Mr. McClanahan. Thank you. Yeah, y'all are blessed with me again tonight. Um, we can take it. <laughs> <laughs> we're fine. 
agenda was pretty simple. Uh, we had a couple of uh, interesting aspects of it, but we managed to work through all of it. Um, the uh, biggest piece was the uh, Drury Properties um, at uh, County Road 313, uh, wishing to uh, rezone all of it to a planned development district, both the piece I think that's up for annexation right. tonight, as well as the piece that's already in the city. Um, and we did approve both of those items. We had uh, we also uh, approved a uh, record plat for Deerfield Estates, uh, the preliminary plat rather uh, for Deerfield Estates. Had an interesting piece to that, and I'll bring it up tonight. The uh, originally all of the western board of that that is up against two adjacent pieces of property. Um, there was an agreement that if they developed anything on it, they would put in a buffer zone of a um, some sort of a tree that would basically block the two pieces of property from each other. So the tree was never uh, decided on or any of that. So uh, we had the Bush family there and uh, they were kind of questioning this. So uh, we allowed all of them to go out into the hallway out here and discuss it. And they came to an agreement on what they were going to do. And so everything is cool with that from our understanding as far as last Wednesday night was concerned. But uh, I think they're coming together and going to go up, uh, have a written agreement and uh, it should all be taken care of that way. That's those pr properties that are on 313 that back up to the, what you read. Yeah, so yeah. everything on that, uh, on their east side of their property, the west side of the jury piece, and yeah. then along the southern border of yeah. theirs next to the street. Okay. Uh, all of that will have some sort of a uh, evergreen or a uh, block uh, tree. Once they decide on the species, then they'll put the centers and they'll, all that will work out. So well, thank you for getting that worked out at that level. Probably it, <laughs> it was it was fun to watch for a little while. Um, public hearing um, we had for um, uh, three uh, three thirty seventy William Street uh, at St. Francis Drive. Um, it's a um, uh, development code for signage. Uh, it's the Aspen Dental Committee, so we approved that. Okay. Um, crossing at Hopper Road, which is the piece at Hopper and uh, Mount Auburn, and uh, the southern uh, southeast, southwest corner of it, uh, preliminary plant for that, um, uh, or not preliminary, record plant for that was approved. Um, Rabin Subdivision, it um, was brought to their attention that their building actually sat on a piece of easement that was the old rail. Uh, track through there, uh, right across from, you know, they're on Independence. Remember that old rail track? Yes. So uh, we uh, approved a subdivision record plat that actually put their building on their piece of property rather than the easement. So uh, the easement was, um, uh, well, I guess we dumped the easement and put yeah. all of it in one piece. That's uh, on the agenda tonight, too, Council. Uh, Cape West 16th subdivision, uh, record plat down at the um, southern end. Uh, I can't remember, I think it's um, more than that, the, a street on the back side, but it's around the old Blue Cross building down there on the southern end. Yeah, Bloomfield and Kell Farm. Yep. And um, yeah, Kell Farm, there you go. Um, that, uh, I think there's three different pieces there. Uh, we approved that. That's in. Item 27 to 9, the new ordinances. Mm -hmm. And then Shadowwood Villas, uh, townhouses, uh, Hopper and Hawthorne. Um, they're dividing two of the townhouses. They needed a property line in the middle so they can be sold as uh, separate they've, units. They've changed their mind a few times, haven't they? Uh, that's been a fun one to follow up to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nothing new. And then the other item we had was we did elect new officers. Um, so, uh, for the most part, uh, Jeff Glenn will be your new uh, uh, chairman. Uh, Bruce Skinner is the vice chairman, and uh, Mr. Um, or Kevin. Um, oh shucks, Grazer. Yes, I don't know why I drew a blank on the name. Is um, the uh, new secretary? Okay. Any Council, questions. Any questions? Anybody? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and Merry Christmas to y'all. Thank you for your work this year. You've had several little, several issues this year. Yes. Containers, chickens, and.
but, it's, <laughs> but it's fun. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Pat. Merry Christmas. Sportsplex operations report. Good evening, uh, Mayor Redeker and city council members. I am pleased to give you a six month update on where we're at with our reservations and operations uh, with the indoor sports plex. Uh, first of all, though, I want to uh, thank our CVB folks. Um, without uh, their participation, we would not be able to um, do, be doing as well as we are right now. So Brenda, thank you, John, thank you all. But Alyssa and Alisa and Heather Davis, um, Alisa works specifically with sports marketing and Heather Davis is our um, facility supervisor are here to give you a presentation and then to answer any questions on uh, the sports flex. So, Welcome Heather. Thank you. I'm gonna get it started, I guess, and try to work this remote. So we'll see what happens. Um, so obviously, we're going to do a six-month report for you on the Sportsplex. Um, we opened on May 6th, our grand opening. I think most of you guys were there, so you're well aware of, of that. Um, hopefully, most of you guys have been to the facility as well. Um, just as a review, we have the turf side of the facility, which is um, two indoor turf fields. Um, they're netted all the way around, so we can play baseball, softball, things like that there as well. We have four batting cages on, on this one, on field one on the left. There's a couple of them down you might see in that picture there. Uh, on the court side, uh, we have six basketball courts, which can convert to 12 volleyball courts. We can also go full court volleyball, so we can do six volleyball courts, which we've done um, a time or two as well. And you can't see it there, but we have portable bleachers for everything, so that allows us to set up for different events. Um, lobby and concession seating area. Um, the concessions is open during our youth leagues and our tournaments. It's not open just on a daily basis um, at this point, so, but we try to open it when we think we're actually going to have revenue coming in and a lot of people in the facility. Um, you can see the dining area there as well as um, the customer ser service area. All right, so the main purpose for this facility is to host tournaments. Um, you can look through that there and see since we've opened, um, we've hosted 11 what I consider large tournaments. These are youth tournaments. We've had a couple of adult tournaments as well, and we'll have more coming up, but those are generally smaller tournaments at this point. Um, eight basketball, one volleyball, and then two basketball-volleyball combination, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, seven different tournament organizations. We've met mainly with those tournament organizers before we even opened the facility. So months leading up to that, um, we got those tournament organizers in and spoke with them and booked tournaments, especially for the summer before we even got started. Uh, the states represented is pretty impressive, actually. We were looking at a uh, probably a four to five hour radius that we were going to draw teams from. And if you guys look at those, Michigan, Texas, those are highlighted. Also, Iowa, Nebraska, those are pretty good drive. I think we had one team, they came from Houston, Texas. They said it was about a 12 hour drive. For them and same for a team out of Michigan. So that's a pretty good haul to get there to play basketball for those teams. Um, average number of teams, you can see about 50 and number of spectators about 675. That's an average two-day tournament for us. Um, some notable tournaments, um, Rib City Shootout. Um, that's a tournament director out of Dexter, Missouri. He's actually the girls basketball coach. Um, they did two of those. Uh, the first one had 111 teams, which is huge. Um, that's a basketball and volleyball combination. The second one was smaller, but the great thing about it, it was on Thursday and Friday. So that opened up our weekend still to, to bring other things in. So um, that's going to happen again next year, um, which those kind of tournaments are really helpful for us. Um, they also played in the community at uh, Cape Central High School and Jackson High School. So they were actually too big for our facility and had to branch out, which is a good thing for other people. Um, you see a couple pictures here. That's one of the Rib City shootouts, the volleyball and basketball going on at the same time. And then um, some more tournaments we had. Under Armour Men America. Obviously, when you have Under Armour attached to it, it's a big name. Um, these were highly recruited, uh, mainly high school basketball players. So they were some of the better players in, across the Midwest. Uh, we had 77 teams, 10 states represented for that one. 
Um, that actually started over in Carbondale, but they moved it to um, to the Sportsplex because they just couldn't hold it there. They needed more courts under one roof. So that's one thing we can provide to people that they aren't getting other places. They're having to travel between gyms and now they can come all play under the same roof. Um, Threat Hoops is another one that had a lot of high caliber teams and players involved. Um, it wasn't quite as many teams, but the what was really good about that one, it was actually the end of the summer in August. And a lot of these were brand new teams that we had never even seen before. So you kind of expect the same teams over and over and it was actually new teams. So, so that's good to see that there's more teams out there that we can still draw from. Um, actually that one went so well, that one and the Rib City that they're gonna add additional tournaments to the um, ones they already had scheduled last year. So that's good for us to see. Um, CMO Conference Volleyball. That one kind of got put in our laps um, due to some unforeseen circumstances at Notre Dame High School. Um, they moved part of that here this year. And that's another one that went extremely well, and they've decided to move that tournament, um, I guess, the next couple years at least uh, to the Sportsplex and bring the South and the North together, and everybody's going to play there. So it's good when things go well and then they keep coming back. So we're happy to get that one back next year. A couple pictures here as well. That's Under Armour Mid America. Um, they actually called today about some more dates too, so they're interested in coming even more. And there's a picture of the SEMO Conference Volleyball Tournament. Um, so future tournaments are probably what you guys are really interested in. Um, we're projecting in 2018 that we could get 34 weekends of tournaments. Um, volleyball is going to crank up here within the next couple of weeks, so That'll be something new. Um, we're just hitting that club season. So they start the first weekend in January. And Gateway Region and NSSC Volleyball have, I think, four tournaments each coming up um, January through May. So that'll be good to get them cranked up and going. Rip City Shootout will be back, SEMO Conference Volleyball, and then Dig for Life. If you guys are familiar with that, it takes place over at SEMO for the most part as well. I think they played at Notre Dame this year. Um, they want to expand that tournament and be able to grow it and get some new teams in. So they're actually going to move some of their courts over to the Sportsplex as well and be able to add some additional courts. So we'll have that one next September as well. Um, basketball, the top two there, um, some tournaments we've already had. Elevate Hoops is an interesting one. They're from the East Coast, and they're kind of those high-caliber teams as well. And they're trying to move into the Midwest, so they selected us as one of their facilities that they want to move into. MAYB is out of Kansas. It's a um, Mid-America Youth Basketball. It's a pretty big program across the Midwest. So they're going to have one of their later tournaments in the season. I think it's in July at the Sportsplex. So that'll be more of kind of a regional tournament for them. So some big time teams probably there. Hoops Midwest is out of Springfield, Missouri. Um, Midwest Youth Tournaments is also interesting. They approached us. They're out of Indiana and they have they do baseball and basketball. So they're actually going to book three basketball tournaments and then they're going to book two baseball tournaments out at Shawnee as well. So it we kind of put them into a, a five tournament package, which is good for, for everybody. So um, Larry Hughes basketball Academy is out of St. Louis. They actually called me last week looking for a couple of weekends. So that, that'll be a new one. And the other three there we've already touched on. And then athletes plus cheerleading is obviously a local cheerleading group, but they have a big, a big cheerleading meet as well. So, um, Tournament revenue, probably of interest to you guys here. Um, so with the revenue side of things, um, if you're looking at this as a single event at the facility, which is typically two days, sometimes it's a one day event, um, our average facility revenue, which means like our court rental, um, what, the, what we're going to get for it's about thirty-seven fifty. We hope that can increase as we go. We've had to kind of work with people to get get started a little bit. Um, average facility expenses that is just additional payroll. So you're like, oh, that's not much at all. That's because that's um, outside of our normal hours, like on a Saturday or Sunday. What we're paying additionally, as well as any overtime um, that occurs. Now we know there's some other expenses involved, but without getting through a full year yet. It's kind of hard to provide what those what those numbers are. We know obviously there's electric and gas, but um, just looking today, I mean that's ranged from electric a month from four thousand to thirteen thousand so far. So it's hard for us to kind of gauge where that's going to go 
over the winter. And same thing for gas. It's been anywhere from 175 in a month to 1700. So we'll need to get through a full year to really see how that's all going to play out. So an average facility net revenue for a weekend is about 3320 right now. Um, concession stand plays a really big role in our revenue. Obviously, when we bring in these tournaments, um, we make actually more in the concession stand than we actually make off the facility rental. So was, there's the expense that goes along with that as well, which you can see there, which is the payroll and the food costs. Um, but we still net about 1675 right now. I expect that to go up with a lot of volleyball tournaments coming up. Volleyball girls eat a whole lot. So um, that's <laughs> that's good to see that there's a lot of volleyball coming up. So I think that'll that'll probably get over the 2000 mark easy on the, on the net revenue per tournament. Uh, as far as the exclusive beverage agreement, we signed that with Pepsi. Um, they, so they do all the, the beverages in the concession stand as well as the vending machines. And included with that, they gave us a $5,000 annual payment and also the vending machine commission, which is about 20%, which on a tournament weekend can add up pretty quick. Um, the Gatorade machine's pretty much empty by the end of the first day, typically, and we're having to get it filled back up. So um, that's some good additional revenue for us. That will continue? Yes. The annual payment will continue? Yes, it will okay. continue. Um, court rentals, this is more of the local stuff. Um, we have increased these a lot over the last couple months as it's obviously got colder outside. But we're averaging about 50 court rental hours per week. Um, a lot of that comes from those top two things you see there, the volleyball clubs. Um, they're in there basically every day almost. And we have several other groups that use it consistently as well. Um, field rentals are about the same, about 55 hours per week. It's kind of funny. You have two fields versus six courts, but the hours turn out to be about the same. People are fighting over field space right now. So um, school baseball, softball, and soccer teams is something we didn't think about that much when we opened, but um, a good example is Saxony Lutheran High School boys soccer went to state this year. And then the two weeks leading up to them going to state, they were in there about every other day practicing in the facility. So it gives them another place to go when it's cold or rainy outside. Same thing with the baseball and softball team. So we can provide that now with, with an indoor facility. You see some of the other organizations that run a lot from us. Um, the one there on top, the Cape Newton Optimist Club, they moved their indoor soccer league to the Sportsplex this year. It's probably some of you guys have been out there and seen that. Um, we did a $10,000 agreement with them. So that'd be 10,000 revenue, um, which also gives the opportunity to open the concession stand and stuff with kids in there buying food. Uh, that's We're in the middle of that right now. It's a six week league, seven days a week, with the exception of a couple holidays. So it's a good, good rental for us there. And then you can see a lot of the other ones that rent from us. Um, there's a picture of the indoor soccer league. Um, we have that dasher board system. You can see around there that the Cape Newton Optimist Club provided us with um, I think 90 percent of the funding for those. So that's a really nice system that they didn't have before. It's pretty much it's kind of set up like a hockey rink if you haven't seen it. We just have turf instead of ice, but it's the same concept. And this is an example of a SEMO Smasher softball. They do a Friday night clinic every week during the winter. They get about 40 to 50 girls out there every week. So that's a good rental for us as well. Um, other facility rentals, um, the Visit Cape Eclipse viewing. Obviously, that's not going to happen all the time. But um, we did do that out there this year, which you can see a picture of that there. Um, some other camps there. Breakthrough Basketball Camp, actually out of Iowa, came down and did a camp. Challenger Soccer is a British Soccer camp it was interesting, um, a good camp as well. And you can see the martial arts event there. Um, that's something that we're really going to be working hard to try to bring in more um, events like that. That was good on a slow weekend for us to get a uh, martial arts tournament in the facility. Something different. Uh, some other facility rentals, birthday and team parties. Those have picked up a lot as, it got, as it's gotten colder as well. Um, school field trips, we get calls. Usually, we actually, as soon as we open, we had a few, and then we're getting people calling us about the end of the year this year as well. And then we have meeting rooms, too. Um, we've been able to add some additional programs that have been good revenue programs for us so far. Uh, Fall Youth Volleyball had 161 kids in that, and Junior Grizzlies Basketball, 142. Those are new programs that did not exist before. 
Um, adult soccer league is something we've added. We're getting ready to do our winter season, but our um, we did an end of the summer season, which had 20 teams, which was pretty good for the first time we've ever ran that with um, co-ed and men's division. So we're expecting in the winter, it'll probably bring in even more than that with, with the cold outside. And then spring NFL youth flag football we're going to do as well as some summer sports camps. Um, here's some pictures of our fall youth volleyball and our junior Grizzlies basketball program. Um, we've also had the opportunity to move some of our ex existing programs, the sports related ones out to the sportsplex, which has helped a lot at our community centers to open them back up as community centers. So I know the people mm -hmm. in those communities appreciate that. Um, it's also helped us, especially with our summer leagues, our summer basketball and volleyball, to grow those leagues with having more courts available. And everybody likes to play on a wood court instead of tile. So um, that definitely helps with that. You can see some of the camps and clinics that we've done or will be doing also. Um, sports specific training is another uh, program that we offer. It, we started it about middle of July. Um, we do baseball, basketball, football, soccer, softball, and volleyball. That is continuing to grow. Uh, we have about 20 trainers right now. They are current college athletes, current and former high school and college coaches. So we have some really good trainers. Um, and like I said, the, the kids that are participating in that continue to grow as we go. And we expect that to, to get much bigger than it is right now. Year one budget. Um, so just so you guys know, hours of operation, this came up a couple times lately. Um, some people think we're open all day. Some people think we're not open to the public at all. But right now we are open um, Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 8.30. Um, Friday's 3.30 to 7, Saturday's noon to 5, and Sunday's noon to 8 to the general public. So, so we really shortened those hours and tried to hit those time frames where we think we'll get the most people in the facility. Obviously, the first thing we do is rent the facility. Anybody wants to rent it, and then the general public can come in and play on whatever is available, which sometimes, especially on the field side, there's not much available at all. So um, estimated revenue. Obviously, we did this budget last January and didn't have a whole lot to base it on yet. <laughs> so we estimated our revenue at $475,000. we are currently around the $170,000 mark, maybe a little more than that now. Um, but we're still projecting that we'll get to that 475. I know that looks like a lot, but our, our big programs and tournaments and leagues are still coming. Um, the fall season is definitely the slowest. Um, everybody's outside football, um, soccer especially, and then in you know, volleyball season. So uh, that'll be our slowest time, and we're past that. So we really expect to jump up on the revenue side um, over the next six months. So we still think we can get to that. 475 mark. Um, estimated expenses, we budgeted 846. We're currently about 274, uh, but we think we'll come in well below that, about 200,000, hopefully less than what we budgeted, which would be great at 650,000. If we can meet those numbers, then we'll be at an 80% cost recovery for the first year, which is a pretty good number. Sure. Um, I know we're aiming for 100%, but for the first year, I think 80% is, is pretty good. So hopefully we can get there. <laughs> um, sponsor program. Uh, this is something we started at the end of the summer as well. We offer this on the court side and the turf side. Um, it's wall signage that we do. Um, we do courts, which you can see there, a couple of them that we have done. So they basically get a scoreboard sign and the, the wall below. Um, those, it's hard to tell from a picture, but those are really big signs. Those are five foot by 16 foot signs, the ones on the bottom. And they look really nice and very colorful out there. So uh, if anybody's looking to sponsor something, they look really good. So um, we have wall signage as well, but that's not um, on a specific court. Uh, so there's a list of some of the ones that, that we do there. We expect this first year will um, be at least 30,000 revenue just from the sponsor signage. So it's a really good way to bring in some extra revenue. The good thing going forward is we have the upfront cost of the sign the first year. And then these are three-year agreements. So the next two years, that'll just be straight revenue. So that's really good to not have that expense on top of it in the next few years. Um, some challenges that we're facing or we expect to face. Um, every facility, obviously, year one is going to have its challenges, and you're trying to figure it all out. 
Um, but retaining current tournament organizers and tournaments, I think, could be a challenge. Um, I think that most of the time we're going to succeed with this, though. Um, I've told you a couple of examples already of people that are actually booking more the next year. But what we found, there are some times of the year where it's hard to get teams. Um, that late November, early December time frame is kind of tough. So we're looking to maybe do some different things then or possibly even try to offer our own tournaments instead of booking other people in. But I think for the most part, we'll be able to retain the tournaments that we have, but it's still a challenge. Um, booking hotel rooms has been a little challenging as well for the teams. Um, pricing and availability. Um, pricing wise, obviously we're a small market, but our prices for our hotels are quite a bit higher than the big markets. I think um, teams that typically go to St. Louis and places like that are surprised by how much it costs when they come to Cape and try to book a hotel. But obviously there's hotels all over the place in St. Louis, so it's a competition, but um, that's a little difficult for us. And then um, the availability, I think uh, that problem may be gone now or in the future at least as we're bringing in more hotels. Um, but in the summer, it was difficult because uh, there was a lot of things already booked before we opened up and people already had their hotel rooms. So um, the surrounding areas got a lot of hotel rooms from, from our tournaments in the summer, which is good for them. But um, we were basically topping off all the other hotels at the time. But hopefully with a couple new hotels and jewelry back, um, we won't have that issue in the future. Um, leasing the facility for fall sports tournaments, I've already discussed a little bit that fall season is kind of the slower season for us. So we have some ideas of some non-traditional sports we're going to try to to get into the facility at that time. Um, selective booking. Uh, obviously, when you you know you start, you're kind of you're taking everybody that wants to come in. We kind of after this first year, have to look at who are strong players, who are weaker players. We have new tournament directors trying to get in without spots available right now. So we'll take a good look at um, you know maybe where we can fit them in in the future because we'd like as many different tournament directors in the facility as possible. And then court and field availability. I mentioned that a little bit also, but right now it's kind of hard to find spots sometimes. So um, we're, I mean, at peak times, usually at 5 to 8 p.m. and everybody's trying to get there. So um, that's, that's become a, a little bit tough, but that's a good thing if we're having that problem. So I won't complain too much about that. Um, and then finally on, on mine, uh, the goals this all along but 100% cost recovery within five years hopefully we can get there before five years I think we're on the, the right track so um, as a reminder that doesn't include the economic impact factor which Elise is going to discuss so that's just the facility itself the 100% cost recovery um, booking 37 weekends for tournaments or large events we think we can get to 34 hopefully in 2018 we can find a few of those non-traditional tournaments and get those in here and I think we can definitely get up to 37 which will be more than two-thirds of the weekends um, throughout the year. Um, offering some tournaments of our own and discuss maybe in those slower times we we take um, that on ourselves and, and offer our own tournaments which the revenue for that is always good when you're getting the gate and the um, the team and everything else so um, we're going to try to offer a couple probably basketball but we'll look into other sports as well maybe soccer or volleyball also. Um, offering Friday night youth leagues allows us to open up our concession stand, um, which is good. And then that's always kind of been a slow night we've stayed away from. And we, we ran our fall volleyball on Friday night and realized, hey, people come Friday night. So maybe this is something we can add that night and stay off the weekends as much and book those for the tournaments and play the leagues on Friday nights and keep it busy um, throughout the whole weekend. Um, growing our sports specific training program. And then finally, finding those non-traditional sports and activities for those fall weekends or the slower times. So uh, I think that's all I have. And I'm going to let Elisa talk, and then we'll answer some, uh, some before questions. Before you go, uh, I'm a, Council may have some questions, but I have one. Uh, okay. Your first six months, say 26 weeks, how many weekends were you dark, where you didn't have tournaments? Um, we had 11 out of the 26 weekends booked for tournaments and so we had some smaller um like the martial arts i didn't include in those we so about well. how you were about, yeah, half, I'd say about half. six months yes we're good yeah. this has been the slow period the fall yes the, slow period. <laughs> the fall is definitely the slow period i was actually surprised by 
um, you know, I didn't think about it that that much. I guess my next question was going to be <laughs> your goals for, and you already did it. Right. So yeah, our next seven months we're booked almost every single weekend. So are you? Yeah, okay. through January through July. So it's looking good. And I know what amazes me was, you know, that original goal was to fill up our hotel rooms during the winter months. You know, mm -hmm. We didn't have any tournaments at the, at the Shawnee Complex. I'm surprised at how many tournaments you're having during the warm weather months. Mm -hmm. And I know that's contributing to your challenges with hotel rooms because you probably have tournaments at Shawnee and at the sports mm -hmm. clubs on the same weekend. Yes, um, we actually we meet with um, our CBB on a monthly basis and discuss those tournaments. We can kind of look ahead to what we have coming up at all of our facilities. Um, but yes, that um, a lot of those people already had booked for softball and baseball, and then we threw a basketball tournament in on top of it, and they're just trying to find a room at that point. So uh, I think the summer will stay busy. Um, obviously, kids are out of school then, so people are willing to travel. But uh, yeah, the summer from basically well, as soon as we open in May, through the second week in August, we were pretty busy. Uh, I know at the at the beginning there was a, a question of how much local during the week you would do and how many you opened. Are you comfortable with where you've settled in now with hours? I, I think and so. Uh, as far as the expense part of keeping it open. Yeah, we've made adjustments along the way too. Um, in the summer, we opened at one p.m. Obviously, the kids are looking for something to do in the afternoon. When school got back in session, we didn't open until 3.30, so we made that adjustment. Um, Saturdays, we were opening at 9, and we saw that there weren't, wasn't very many people coming in between 9 and noon, so we waited to start uh, opening at noon. So we've made some of those adjustments, which I think um, have helped. And while we're there during the day, the lights are off, and it's cold in there right now. So we're trying to save <laughs> wherever we can. So. Um, but I think um, the hours we're working with right now are, are pretty good. And I mean, even today, uh, I left, there was probably about 40 people, just general public in the gym playing. So, so we're making that revenue off of that as well. Okay. It's amazing to me, your goal is to have 37 weekends. You've already got 34 bookers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is people fight over the same weekends. That's where we got to try to find those other spots, especially in the fall, to find somebody to fill them. Because everybody... <laughs> Um, once, especially uh, March is a big month, and then the summer, but also that uh, December, January, February, people are looking to book then. So yeah. uh, we got to find some people that are willing to take some of those other weekends. So it's the ones we have to find right now. I'm Very interested to see just what the total economic impact is, if you could figure what that would be with spectators and the hotel rooms and everything else. Well, yeah. Lisa's going to try I mean, to tell you. Think <laughs> that's and, great. I don't expect that to come from you. That's, yeah, that's coming up. That. <laughs> uh, any well, other questions before? Very complete report. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay, Elisa. Hi. I have handouts, so that's fun. Look, it works good. I'm Elisa Ferris. Um, for those of you that may not know me, I'm the director of sales for the Cape Girardeau Convention and Visitors Bureau or Visit Cape. Um, so, not only do I handle sports tourism, which I'm mainly focusing on today, but I also do our meetings market, our group tours market, and then in general help out with um, anybody that's visiting Cape Girardeau. So, today we're going to talk a little bit about economic impact. Um, of sports in general and of the sportsplex for the last six months and how Visit Cape works with Parks and Recreation Department um, to make sure that sports is both positive, um, the impacting the families and the visitors to the community, but also positively impacting Cape Girardeau economically. Um, so I attend the National Association of Sports Commissions Symposium every year. Um, short version NASC. We have a lot of acronyms in this industry, as many others do. Um, so at every symposium, they provide a state of business report. Um, and that state of business report is compiled from CBBs, sports commissions, um, anyone in the United States that's a member that handles sports. Um, we are asked to provide a survey information. 
And so from that information, um, they found that in 2016, um, $10.47 billion um, were spent on sports events in the United States alone. So that's a 10% increase from 2015. Um, I feel really good about that number because I see how the number of tournaments has exploded here in Cape Girardeau since I started in my position five years ago. Um, and that's all sports, so that's a national number, that's youth, that's amateur, um, all sporting events. Um, we, as a destination, estimate the economic impact of sports um, in several different ways. The CVB here, or Visit Cape, we use um, a calculation that's given to us by the Missouri Division of Tourism. Um, and so other destinations will use maybe their own internal calculator, um, Destination Marketing Association International's calculator, or maybe they um, outsource that to a company that specializes in that type of data analysis. So um, why do we estimate? Well, we estimate because visitor spending is very complex. And if you are on the um, CVB radar at all, you've probably heard us give presentations at First Friday or Rotary meetings where we talk about why visitor spending is complex. Um, day trippers are different than overnight visitors, um, obvious for reasons that hotel night stays included in that overnight um, more than the, the day tripper. Um, hotels, motels, restaurants, attractions, shopping venues, gas stations, um, you know, that all contributes to visitor spending. So the CVB, um, Visit Cape, we use a basic formula because we feel very confident in those numbers. We feel cons that they're conservative and yet they're not too conservative. Um, we don't want to overblow an event at all. Um, so our basic formula is the number of people um, times 1.5, which is a multiplier for sports. Um, this is all passed down from the Missouri Division of Tourism. And then $95, which is the average per person daily expenditure. So that equals our estimated economic impact. In the packet that I gave you on one of the pages, I think it's the first one, there are a couple of different types of tournaments listed with an estimate number of attendees to that tournament the requested number of room nights that they asked us to maybe provide them blocks or rate assistance with, and then the estimated economic impact of those events. So just here for presentation purposes, um, I put one of them that's on your sheet and one that is not. Um, so the I-55 um, Slam, which was a basketball tournament, we have the estimated economic impact of that tournament um, as $85,500. <coughs> Um, that's here in the community. Um, that's two nights. Um, we, they estimated that they had room attendees of $600. And I'm kind of going to talk a little bit about um, the importance of remembering your estimates too. And then for a Gateway Region Volleyball Tournament, which will happen later on in 2018, um, we estimate attendees is lower. Um, so that kind of contributes to the difference in those two amounts. Um, Heather talked about hotel rooms, and I'm going to talk a little bit about room blocks and room rate assistance and in working with tournament directors on those two things. Um, we have found in the sportsplex being in existence, um, we've obviously been working with a larger number of basketball tournaments and now a larger number of volleyball tournaments. Those two types of sports are completely different beasts. <laughs> Basketball tournament parents typically do not book their rooms very far in advance. However, the volleyball tournament parents will book their rooms months in advance. And so this also means that tournament directors don't necessarily think of getting room blocks well in advance of a tournament. And so part of my job and part of the sports plex job and our hospitality partners in Cape Girardeau is to educate the tournament directors on how important it is to do these things early and before your tournament starts. Because we are very fortunate here in Cape Girardeau that we do have a lot of things going on that fill up our hotel rooms, especially during the summer. <laughs> um, so there were several instances where she said we had a tournament at Shawnee and also at the sports plex. 
those are tough weekends to find a room here in Cape Girardeau. Um, right now, um, I am still considering all of those tournament directors are work in progress in getting that information to them, but um, it's definitely um, getting better. And um, I had a tournament director for a softball tournament contact me last week for a tournament in April for room block. And I basically wanted to hug her through the phone. I was so happy she was contacting me so early. Um, so we are getting there. Um, so um, visit Cape Markets, all venues in Cape Girardeau. And I want to say that because we all work together. Um, I know that there have been events at the Sportsplex where they're so large they have to go to other gyms. And it's important that when I attend these conferences and shows that I have at my disposal my entire book of all the facilities. And I gave you copies of a proof of our most recent um, sports facility guide in your packet just so you have that. Um, so we market all of the venues. Um, I attend two sports-centered expos per year. I attend NESC and I attend Connect Sports. Um, we also, um, through that, our expos are um, appointment-based. So between the two of them, I average about 25 appointments. At, um, 20, I had 21 at NESC this last year and I had around um, 30, 31 at uh, Connect Sports. When I say appointments, um, I don't mean I get to sit and talk with somebody for 25 minutes. I get to sit and talk with somebody for six to seven minutes. And I have to convince that person in some way, shape, or form that they want to be in Cape Girardeau, <laughs> um, especially if it's a first time. If it's a second time meeting them, um, and I've been working with them on trying to get them to Cape Girardeau, it's what do we have that's new? Um, and thankfully, I've been able to provide them with multiple um, new things in Cape Girardeau in the last couple of years. Um, we provide room block um, and rate assistance. And so rate assistance, we have some tournaments that are very, very frequent. Um, and so they just want to kind of lock in a rate. So if you call and you're with so-and-so's tournament, you can get that special rate. And then we have others that want to specifically block for their teams because they know that they're going to do that in advance. Um, so we help with both of those. Um, we also have funding assistance. Um, we base our funding assistance on the estimated economic impact of an event, but then we also have a new event funding pool, and that is to entice new tournament directors to take a chance, to take a chance on coming to Cape Girardeau, to get their foot here in the door, to get them in town, to see what we have to offer. Um, so over since the Sportsplex opened, um, we have provided around $10,000 in funding assistance to those tournaments um, to get them here to Cape Girardeau and to see that facility. Um, we also provide visitor information. I have a copy of a generated um, email by me. I do all of the information for that um, and tailor it to the specific weekend of that event. Um, and that gets sent out to the tournament directors so that they can send that to their coaches so that their coaches um, can send that to the parents so that they're not questioning what else is going on or where can I eat or where can I find this information. It's easily accessible to them through that. Um, we also do welcome bags and more traditional, um, you know, dropping brochures off at the hotel um, for participants, so that sort of thing. Um, we advertise. Um, we advertise in um, appropriate publications as we can, um, as the marketing dollars are available. Um, we advertised in sports sports planning guide um, of 2018. Through that, we got a advertorial, which I also included in your packet. Um, and in that, a writer highlighted how Cape Girardeau has every amenity of a larger community, but none of the hassles. Um, and it's true. We really, really do. And you guys know that. Um, I'm also part of Show Me Missouri Sports, um, which is a collective of 13 other um, destinations and myself, including the Missouri Division of Tourism. When I go to those conferences and shows, we also sponsor them as Show Me Missouri Sports, so we have higher visibility. And our main tool, um, you know, that's our, one of our main tools to get sports into the state of Missouri, um, because sports has an overall um, major impact. So um, 
the future of sports um, with the addition of um, obviously the Drury Plaza, the downtown courtyard, and then um, soon to be the Fairfield Inn and Suites. Obviously that helps out from a hotel standpoint. It also helps out from a hotel uh, loyalty point um, standpoint. We have um, all the great loyalty programs here in Cape Charter, so that helps too. Um, the Sportsplex has obviously offered us a slew of more options. Um, and then challenges. And so, you know, in this first six months, obviously that November and December, those two kind of difficult slow months, because starting in January, um, there are tournaments almost every single weekend there at the Sportsplex. Um, so we're, we have got to figure out some of those weird out of the box um, sports that we can get in there, the martial arts, but then also um, maybe some sports that are geared towards a different uh, demographic um, in terms of uh, just like pickleball or, I mean, there's Quidditch. I mean, there are all kinds of weird sports at all of these shows. Um, there's non-competitive walking. That's a real thing. <laughs> um, so just trying to think out of the box and figure out ways that we can um, get sports in during those slower months. And that is my presentation. So if you have any questions. Very good. Questions of employees? Thank you. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Good job. And good job, whole team. Thank you. I didn't um, want to, I would be remiss if I would disinterview uh, Chris Eastridge behind me. Uh, Chris is Heather's right hand person and also runs all the programming and concessions out there. And I think you know Scott, he left, but Scott and Heather work heavily on our. Um, quiet and basketball game. Uh, but work heavily on our sponsorship program and our business partnerships and relationships. And so it takes all of these groups, obviously, to work together on year one of operations of a major facility uh, like the sports club. So it's quite unique. You know, we're still learning quite a bit and working through um, scheduling and tidying of things. But overall, it's done a very complimentary to uh, the visit Kate and to our staff and our first. Uh, six year uh, or six month of operations. It's, I guess, you could say it's exceeded our expectations. So we're very, very pleased with this But it's okay. certainly exceeded, um, you know, what we thought was possible, even. So, I mean, congratulations. It's uh, um, further along than, than we thought should be on cost recovery and all those things. And then what we hear is raving. Yeah, we got, we got this, this, uh, um price of hotels to 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 work through and some some odd times but i mean i thought we'd be working about working at that level of detail maybe two or three years in not in the first six months so oh wow yeah really so, uh, incredible thank you Scott. and we did too we didn't realize we were going to be you know as we were during yes. the summer and everything you know when you're trying to book and um, within the first six months in the summer where their hotel rooms are already booked here down a hotel, you know, that provided some challenges for us. So I think both uh, Elisa and Heather alluded to um, this winter and spring uh, will be a really good testament to what the facility really was designed to do, which was to bring in those events during those cooler months and how can we impact our hotel and restaurant capacities and economic impact along with making the facility more successful. Yeah. Very good. Great report. Good job. Magnet, Mr. Maynard. Mayor, Scott, Council, pleasure to be here uh, for my annual Magnet update of what's going on. I'm passing around some information for you to take a look at. I'm going to highlight a couple of things on there and then would be happy to answer any question you have. Um, as best that I can, realizing that Mark Bliss is in the room. So <laughs> that's always a challenge. Just teasing, isn't it? Mark. Uh, real quickly, <laughs> first, I want to thank um, Mayor Rediger. I want to thank you for your almost eight years of service on the Magnet Board. Uh, Danny Esner, your seven plus years of service on the Magnet Board. Uh, Robbie Gards joined us relatively recently. And Bob, I think, is, is possibly a next addition. So I appreciate your. Uh, dedicated service to the board and, and continuous work over the many, many years that you guys have served. Uh, real quickly, let me highlight a couple things. Project activity at the top. We currently have, and this is, uh, it could be added to just a little bit, but 17 active projects in various stages. 
representing 520 jobs, 70 million in investment. One change we did make in the last year is we don't put a project on the list anymore unless it's an active project. We get a lot of inquiries, we get a lot of asks, and we submit a lot of information to site selectors and Missouri Partnership on potential projects, but it doesn't make the list unless we are actively working it every month. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. There are nine projects no longer active from December of last year. Those are anything from they don't, they're not doing the project anymore, something else has happened, uh, that kind of thing. We did lose one that we can identify to a different state. Um, and I may come back to that in just a minute with the right to work issue. There, there are some things going on there that I may want to comment on. Uh, select economic development successes I have listed for you there just to highlight a couple, lest we forget. AT&T announced 150 jobs. We announced a new hotel in Jackson. Announced a second TIF project in downtown Cape. Codify has announced 30 new businesses, 75 new jobs, and $6 million in private investment over the past year. Drury Plaza Hotel and Conference Center opened. Sports Complex opened. Several retail restaurant openings that we've seen happen in the past 12 months or so, and you've got some additional ones on the list down there. We have some data benchmarks for you down at the bottom. Those are just for your review. Um, and again, getting that information is difficult as you have to be more than a year ahead before they start printing the other information, but you can take a look at that. On the back, there is a back to this sheet. Business retention and expansion efforts continue. We do this regularly. Uh, I will highlight that key findings for the past year have included important need for mental health facilities, and these are business visits, keep in mind but an important need for mental health facilities and or ways to address that in Cape. Uh, hiring challenges, CDL trained workers, and that's something that we have already taken some, some action towards, and then technical training and certainly soft skills education needs. All of those things we're addressing through the chamber and through Magnet as we move forward. Infrastructure advocacy is listed for you there as well. I will note that we support Ameren's efforts for the electrical grid upgrades. Uh, we have supported that for the last two years that they've attempted to do this. Um, we absolutely believe that it's important to stay in good shape or get ourselves back into good shape. The electrical grid is not as obvious as our highways and transportation. We know when we have potholes in those, can't see the potholes in the electrical grid, but it's important for them to be able to keep that great working shape and important for outages. We get a lot of requests now on projects where we have to list the times, the frequency and duration of outages in the electrical grid in this area. And that's becoming an increasingly important factor. Development highlights is down there for you too. Um, again, we've talked about some of the things we're doing. The one thing I wanted to mention specifically, and thanks to the Missourian, just did a great job on Connect Cape and what we're doing with that from a, uh, a job shadowing standpoint. Gonna, we've done it twice. First time was not many people. Second time was an abundance of people and extremely effective that up again stronger. We're taking the spring off. We're going to come back with it in the fall to build a, uh, a stronger list of businesses and even more individuals who want to participate in that. I've got down some other significant happenings at the bottom. One is our contract with Catalyst Commercial, which we will have to reevaluate at the end of January. Uh, we do not have a home run from them yet. We have several projects that we continue to work things our way, and so we will have to evaluate that as we move forward. For you, just so that you know that, that we're not just, uh, our, our folks are very plugged in at the state level. Um, our staff that works with us at Chamber slash Magnet on at least seven statewide economic development agencies and are very plugged into what's going on at the state level. Um, having said that, I would be happy to entertain questions you may have and certainly do the best I can with, with answering. Comment uh, first, uh, naturally I've thoroughly enjoyed the eight years serving with with Magnet, and congratulate you, John, and the and the team on on what we've achieved in eight years. But my real comment is that we've been able to do that together. Uh, the investment that we make as a city with our partners there and in support you and your and your team is an investment that has paid a lot of dividends and uh, um, hope that uh, uh, continue to flourish in the, in the years ahead. Uh, council, uh, 
that is a great, great investment that we make uh, uh, toward economic development as a uh, as a council and as a as a city uh, investment. And it's great to have uh, have partners that sit with us. Other comments? More to come. Okay. Anyone here to appear before the council on any item that is not on the agenda? Any item not on the agenda? Okay, Scott, if you'll take us through the agenda. All right, we have, um, I'll go through the communications and no presentations tonight. What uh, have communications and reports? Do you have other things you'd like to report on? Mine is only Merry Christmas. All right. It's pretty short, huh? Yeah. Others? We have two public meetings, uh, public hearings tonight. They're on uh, really the same uh, Deerfield property, uh, but uh, we have uh, taxation and a proposed zoning, and then we have the portion that's RE is annexed that is the proposed zoning from C2 to, to a planned development district. So. Uh, we'll have those two public hearings, and then um, there are four items there, and we'll we'll probably take all those at the end of each public hearing. Yeah, thirty and thirty-one, and then we'll do two, and then do thirty-three and thirty-four, as we kind of typically do. Yeah. And then you have thirty-two, which is the uh, ward boundary. As ward well, boundary. So we'll do that as we go through new ordinances. So. And then. Uh, so on the consent agenda, we have the second and third readings of the permanent drainage easements at um, the Rock Garden and at Little Mac. Um, then we have uh, number six is a special warranty deed. Uh, this is out at the old wastewater treatment plant, sale of that property. Um, number seven is the purchase of some property off of South Minnesota. Second, second third reading of that. Uh, number eight will be the second and third reading of uh, rezoning from C1 to C2 at Mount Auburn. Uh, number nine is the second and third reading of the special use permit for bed and breakfast on West End Boulevard. A rezoning from R1 to C1 on 3301 Hopper Road. And then number 11 is the calling of the election for the PRS2. Uh, second and third reading of that. Number 12 starts our resolutions with the first reading of a um, license on an indemnity agreement for the Dales who are uh, installing the water service line on Ingram Street. Uh, 13 is uh, a license and indemnity agreement for fiber optics from uh, essentially uh, <clears throat> academic hall over to their uh, to the university's uh, facilities management building. Number 14 is an agreement with SkyWest Airlines for their um, rental and uh, fuel costs that will be provided. Uh, number 15 is a license and agreement for assigning overhanging North Fountain. I believe that's for the chamber. And uh, number uh, 16 is a hazard mitigation grant. This is a flood buyout for three properties uh, uh, north of uh, uh, on North Main. A couple of property, other properties there. Sure, good to see that one proceeding. Yes. Um, and then uh, 17 is the, um, this is a uh, design uh, agreement with Jacobs. This is for the uh, air quality. It was kind of a late comer to the reg regulations on the new plant. It originally wasn't going to be regulated, then it became regulated. So we have to have Jacobs uh, continue with uh, getting that uh, design so that we can put in the the final uh, piece of that uh, that air regulation. Uh, number eighteen is uh, is uh, we've been talking about radio interoperability for some time. Uh, this is the infrastructure uh, for for that with Motorola. They will put together. Um, they have studied and and now have a proposal to put together the infrastructure that will give us good coverage in our city and great interoperability when people come to our city to help if there's in case of an emergency or uh, we have cooperating agencies that would use that all the time as well. So uh, this is step one. Step two will be um, at the completion of step one, we will then uh, take the um, 
the mobile units, uh, take some of them out and, and figure out how many of those we need in each category of uh, vehicles or uh, mobile units. So uh, this is uh, step one of that and we'll begin that. So this has been a long time coming. Certainly want to recognize. Uh, That's just two lines uh, there, <laughs> but how important that is that we've gotten to this point. And I, when we get a motion in a second, I want to uh, take a minute and come in Holly Hood uh, for all of her work. I saw some of her files were like that thick. I heard around the office a little bit that her hair was black when she came downstairs. And <laughs> she, um, yeoman work, uh, Molly, and I want to I want to sure comment on that because this is a this is a major step, major step forward. Yes, so indeed. we appreciate your your work that you inherited when you came downstairs. But, um, and never, and never easy when you put uh, a bunch of uh, departments together and uh, and try to come up with a solution that's good for everybody, plus people outside the city, and uh, and then working with outside agencies and and uh, having a bid, and then you got a consultant and uh, a lot of pieces to put together there with uh, the county and nine one one as well. So I second second that uh, that explanation. Um, 19 will be the final payments for the, the trail widening at, uh, on the LaCroix Trail. It's great to have that uh, that completed. And then 20 and 21 are the acceptance and release of escrow at Red Hawks Common Phase 3. I've heard a lot of comments about the improvements and widening of the trail, and I think that can be one of our selling points as we proceed with PRS. A uh, lot of comments on that one. That's a lot of items for the consent agenda. Are there items you'd like to uh, remove or uh, abstain from? I have some specific um, questions. Clear. I was hoping to get clarification on regarding the Motorola communication system. Would you like those addressed now? Or sure. So one of the questions I had was what the funding mechanism is going to be for the mobile units. I know that we had identified our sales tax plus casino funds to fund right. video interoperability. Right. And then the project has gone over budget from what we estimated. Is that correct? And you, can you provide some detail? Uh, we originally budgeted about $3 million in the capital improvement program over the course of three different fiscal years to pay for the radio interoperability project. Um, as you can see, the infrastructure portion alone is roughly $3 million, and therefore uh, we don't have the funding at this time to, uh, to pay for the subscriber units, the handhelds, the mobile units. Um, so that will need to be um, a topic of discussion for the future as to how we're going to, uh, to fund the purchase of those. What is the estimated cost of those units? Um, based on the information that we had from uh, Motorola, uh, depending on where we were in our negotiations, um, based on the information they provided, it, the subscriber units alone would, would range between 2.3 to 2.9 million dollars. So that, that cost did fluctuate during the course of our negotiations, depending on whether those units were included with the overall system price or if we separated those out. And, uh, those prices assumed a full uh, build out of all cars, all vehicles, and every and every uh, personnel having a, a mobile unit, which we don't believe we will need. You know that kind of uh, of coverage once we have good uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Um, but but uh, source of in, source of uh, funds, we would probably look toward. Uh, um, the innovation fund uh, and, and possibly the capital fund with casino funds would be the probably the most available fund in order to address that need in the quickest fashion. How many years of funding do we have, or not necessarily years, but how many years would it take given the commitments we already have been making in those funds for other needs? I believe we uh, the the estimated uh, casino revenue is about three is three point one three point two. If you three, assume two. three, yeah. it, it could be one year. If if you did, if you dedicated all of it to that, so, so there are no prior commitments that would uh, we're planning to extend. Those. We may we may have some. Well, we have a two hundred. We have one payment to for the business park. Yeah, we do have that. So that would be that less. And then we also talked to Motorola about the possibility of, of financing the units and doing it. 
over time. But I think we I think we can manage what we need once we figure out. And it wouldn't probably all come from casino. You probably have um, capital. Yeah, we have capital to look, money in there too. You have to look look further at that. I think you know just off the top of my off the top of my head, I would think casino would be the primary. Problem. Yeah, would be primary. What about the like the way the radios communicate? You know, if we're not buying them immediately. You know, I'd like to hear about how the old ones are going to work on the new system, and then how, when some people have new ones, whether or not they'll be able to communicate with people who don't have new ones. All right, everyone will still be able to communicate. The legacy system will be maintained uh, while the new system is um, being constructed and put into place. We do have some radios that currently are capable of operating on the new system. Um, I will say that um, we are, uh, we are proceeding with purchasing of a few radios to outfit um, the new fire vehicles. We're getting a couple radios for out at the airport, um, in addition to a couple uh, handhelds for a police department as well. So we're not, um, and we, we will make sure those are the new dual band, um, latest model Motorola radios, so they will uh, be able to operate on that system. Um, but that that is not a concern. So the <clears throat> The new radios you'd be putting into the new fire trucks we have are going to be able to communicate with no problems with all the other trucks that won't have new radios. That's correct. correct. Okay. And then were some of the challenges, I'd like to hear from the chiefs because I think originally there were some challenges between the needs of the two departments and how your departments didn't necessarily have the same need. You know, so my understanding was that there uh, there was some cooperation that had to happen to make sure that uh, police and fire both met all their needs. And then also we have parks and, and, uh, and public works to use these radio systems too. We did have a, the radio team that was comprised of uh, representatives from both police and fire who have been, I did not do this alone. I've had a team assisting me throughout this whole process and certainly their input uh, from both departments was um, taken into consideration. They went through the, the book and the proposals and made sure that what was being proposed would satisfy both of the department's needs. Um, Public Works doesn't rely on radios as much um, as they used to. I think they, they rely more on cell phones at this point in time. But I don't know if the, the chiefs would like to add anything about the process or whether or not they believe their needs are being met. No, I, the only thing I would say is I, I do feel like our needs are being met. We We've spent, I don't know how much time, over a year uh, with kind of a joint task force, more or less, if you would like to call it that, with us and fire sitting at the table and working through what all exactly we needed. And I, I feel like we've reached that. And I would concur. I mean, obviously, like you said, uh, just the nature of our, of our businesses, police and fire have a, some slightly different needs, but I think we, we met and discussed those and, and have reached a compromise and it's working right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> it's been an ongoing we'll team team we'll, effort. So we'll certainly be pursuing that funding because we need the we need the radios as well as the infrastructures. Yeah, and it's important to me uh, to see that public safety gets the funding that they need because obviously we have to complete this process. You know, when it's sure. we're forty percent of the budget or more, yeah. uh, you know, we can't we can't stop just because we ran out of funding. Right. No, and don't intend to. Anything else on the uh, consent agenda? Okay, go. New ordinances, we have um, the change we discussed last time at, uh, at the study session about securing uh, buildings uh, that are dangerous. And so that moves this forward for the first reading. Um, it's the same as what uh, the draft you were given last, last time. Uh, number 23 are five grants uh, for this fiscal year that uh, would appropriate those funds. Uh, gotten those grants, and so now we want to uh, appropriate the funds. Uh, 24 is an appropriation that uh, that uses uh, capital, uh, excuse me, uh, casino revenue funds uh, this year. Uh, currently, and the reason why this is on your your agenda is because uh, currently the the council policy is that we don't spend funds in the year that we are uh, currently in even though we have the funds we don't spend them until the next fiscal year uh, because we had these urgent uh, public safety needs we felt like we wanted that we should go ahead and appropriate those monies and use them now 
And so uh, this is what that does. And it uses some legacy funds uh, now that then will be paid back in the future. So um, this allows us to move forward rather than just waiting till July to start this project. Uh, it's important that we go ahead and get started. And, uh, and like I said, we'll, we will uh, finish the project as well. Um, so that, that allows us to do that. That's the first reading of that. 25 and 26 are, uh, are the sale of some property along uh, Hopper Road and then uh, keeping of easements on that same property. Um, number 27 is uh, the record plat that uh, Mr. Planahan talked about earlier at Cape West 16th next to uh, the old um, uh, call center. Number 28 is the record plat at Rabin where they had the the uh, train uh, right away that went through there. And then uh, 29 is Shadow Woods, uh, Gary Arnold's property along Hawthorne that he spoke of. 30 through 34 are the Deerfield uh, annexation and zoning and, and uh, boundaries for Ward 6. Number 35 is the appointments for the magnet board. We'll do that with uh, Bob Fox. Well, that'll be done and that's part of the transition as we move forward. Okay, um, Bruce, quickly, uh, any quick, quick update on SkyWest for us? The airline is uh, frankly doing quite well. I had the opportunity actually kind of by mistake to <laughs> actually go in and visit them at their headquarters in St. George, Utah. Um, I got to sit down with uh, the general manager of marketing and development, Greg Atkin, who will be here tomorrow, by the way, for business after hours, um, which we're hosting at the airport. They, um, they're they happy. Uh, they said they know December. They said, look, we couldn't have started at the worst time, but we had no, no decision on that, on that time frame. On the other hand, they're kind of anxious to see what does happen within this next week. Um, right now, we're averaging Total flights averaging about 10, flight, 10 passengers per flight. Uh, last Friday, this past Friday, however, was we had 28 passengers on the flight, had 32 booked. Three people came early and went to, took the morning flight. And another person was late, so otherwise you would have seen numbers actually up in the 30s. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that they really like. Uh, they, they are predicting that we would be a, a business model, which I would expect as well. They'll know more about that by by the end of uh, this month, by the end of December, based on. But the, they're watching they're watching bookings, and they are definitely on a major rise. Uh, so they're they're very happy. Uh, we're happy. The um, if you went to the terminal right now, you wouldn't recognize it. Uh, the entire new new position of the TSA area has been enclosed with uh, new uh, glass partitions. Uh, tomorrow at one o'clock. The different representatives of the machines that uh, TSA uses, the magnetometer, the uh, other machines, x-ray machine, and the uh, body scanner will all be relocated and, and moved and uh, hopefully in time for five o'clock. If not, they said they would break and come back at 630. So, uh, so things are coming along. And, uh, and, and, you know, of course, you saw the new furniture there at the inaugural, um, but, uh, you know, very good. Uh, so far, I'm I'm happy. They seem to be happy, and uh, we're expecting uh, bigger and better things. And they're keeping a close eye on us. They they told me that their hope is that we will eventually uh, be on our own. We won't have to do the Quincy way uh, yeah. as, as time goes on. So. Very good. Yeah. Nothing okay. Good things. Thank you. Uh -huh. Council, anything else for our study session? If not, we do need to have a closed session this evening uh, for legal actions, litigation, communication with our legal counsel and property transactions pursuant to revised statute 610021, numbers one and two, if I got a motion. So moved. By uh, Guard and uh, Gunn and Fox. Second. Those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, we uh, stand adjourned and we will reconvene at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. I don't want to say like, no, no, please don't. <laughs> um, are you going back to the office right now?
Yeah. Um, will you bring this back to me? It's, oh. it's on there. It's on there. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm <laughs> 